Get started. It's uh, by my count 1202, and I want to welcome everybody to the June edition of the Northwest Gas Association's monthly webinar series. We're glad you're here today. Uh, we're excited about this, uh, this presentation, Hydrogen Enabling a Low Carbon Future for Gas Industry and for the gas industry. And I, I just really want to welcome and thank Christine Wiley, uh, Executive Director of the Hydrogen Technology Center at the Gas Technology Institute for joining us today. Uh, we had her bio up on the screen and rather than to take, take time uh, reading that bio, I'll just uh, direct you all uh, to her bio in the registration page and you can get a little, little background on Christine. So thanks Christine for joining us. Judy, could you go to the next slide please? We just want to give you a quick uh, summary of what's coming up in our monthly webinar series and then a couple of notes for today. So first of all, uh, in July, we'll have an update from the Partnership for Energy Progress. I think most of you are familiar with that, uh, that group. They are a, a regional coalition uh, just talking about uh, uh, basically uh, promoting the benefits of, uh, of the gas system in our region as, a, as an energy delivery system. So uh, they'll be joining us in July. August, we're taking our traditional summer break. Um, hopefully, many of you will be at the lake or somewhere else on those that third Thursday of July, but uh, we will not be doing the webinar then. And then in September, we have One Future coming to join, uh, joining us to talk about the 2020, their 2020 methane emissions intensity report. And so if you're unfamiliar with One Future, I just uh, encourage you to go look at their website. I think it's onefuture.com, I believe. Judy will correct me if I got that wrong. Um, but uh, great, great organization, good objective, and uh, a good way of measuring things. So just a couple notes for today. Please keep yourself muted and use the chat function to ask questions. If we start hearing background noise, we may go in and mute you ourselves or at least ask you to. Uh, but you know, you all of, uh, most of you, I think, are, are uh, veterans at the Gas Association's monthly webinar series. So you know if you have questions for Christine, Enter them in that chat function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, everybody will see those. I will see those. And uh, Christine, I'll interrupt you perhaps when you're taking a breath or the natural pause to ask questions that may come in through the chat. So uh, that's how we'll operate. And um, Judy, why don't you go ahead and take the screen down. And as, as we do that, we're going to ask Christine to go ahead and, and share your screen, Christine. And take it away. The floor is yours. And again, we appreciate your time. Okay, perfect. So just want to double check that you can see the slides and they're in full screen. Yes, looks great. Okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for having me and inviting me to speak at the webinar. Um, I'm very excited about being able to share with you some of what we have going on in the hydrogen space. There's a lot of activity right now. Um, and, you know, talk about, you know, how the natural gas industry is going to really play a critical role in helping enable hydrogen. Um, so maybe to step back a little bit um, to talk about, you know, this energy transition that we're in. So we are really faced with dual imperatives here. So when we think about decarbonization and, and, and being able to have and continue economic growth, right? Energy demand is going to continue to increase, but we need to be able to provide clean energy solutions that are gonna be low cost and that can be adopted by economies of various sizes and maturities in, in order to really achieve emissions reductions um, that are needed to achieve these very aggressive climate goals. So really to be effective, we need to have the clean energy transitions that deliver energy that are affordable and accessible and safe and secure. So there are a lot of technologies we can deploy between now and 2030 to help meet some of these interim decarbonization goals. Um, in particular, when we think about being able to lower emissions from electricity. But to get to the you know, very aggressive levels of decarbonization to deep carbon reductions in that post 2030 timeframe, we really need to start expanding innovation really economy wide. And so we need to be able to have um, you know, technologies that can be delivered at scale um, and that are going to be disruptive, especially for those hard to abate sectors like heavy industry or manufacturing or, or heavy duty transport. 
So at GTI, you know, our vision is really around how do we shift from carbon intensive sources of energy to these low carbon solutions? You know, we've set these ambitious climate goals. We need to work towards deep decarbonization by mid-century. But what is our energy system really going to look like in the next 30 years? You know, at GTI, we really envision a more carbon managed future where we're integrating energy systems, where we are able to leverage uh, low carbon gases such as hydrogen, where we're taking advantage of fuels and where we're also taking advantage of our existing infrastructure. Um, and so we're very organized around that long term vision and working towards how do we operationalize that ambition, how do we take that, you know, uh, goal and really take that into action to achieve a low cost, low carbon energy future. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of questions around, you know, why are we so focused around hydrogen right now. Um, for those of you who have kind of been following hydrogen over the past several decades. You know, there's been several cycles of hydrogen hype over, you know, the past several decades. And, and even at GTI, our own research um, really dates back to the mid 60s. But I think despite the various peaks um, associated with the hydrogen economy, it never really took off. But I do think that this time is very different. The key drivers are very different now and they are much more urgent. So you have this increased global attention around climate change and the reduction of emissions is really driving a need to be able to develop and deploy low carbon technologies at a rapid pace and at a really unprecedented extent. And then we're also witnessing these market changes and that, that's signifying this transition to a low cost, low carbon energy system. So for example, you have a, a global race that's underway, right? You have countries across the globe, they're implementing national hydrogen plans as a part of their decarbonization strategies. You see that happening in parts of Asia. You see it happening in Europe. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of movement in that area. And then you also see a lot of corporations worldwide really accelerating their own commitments to carbon neutrality and to be, being able to reduce emissions. And then I think the third piece, which is really important when we think about technology acceleration and development is around these new sources of capital that are investing in clean fuels, which now includes hydrogen. So we have this really extraordinary opportunity to integrate hydrogen into our energy system and then you know, to use it strategically to help decarbonize parts of our economy. So, you know, maybe just to do a little bit of hydrogen 101, it is the lightest and the smallest, most abundant element. Um, however, it doesn't exist freely in nature. So it really only exists in compound form, um, you know, either as water or as other hydrocarbons, which means um, to be able to use it, you know, we have to produce it or separate it from another source. Um, it's colorless, it's odorless, it's non-toxic. Um, you know, one of the advantages associated with hydrogen is that it has the highest energy content of any fuel by weight. You can see that in the chart here, about three times that of gasoline um, as, as shown in this chart. But it also happens to have the lowest energy content by volume, so probably about four times less than gasoline. Um, it's an energy carrier. So what does that mean? It means it's able to transport energy from one place to another. So, you know, one of the greatest features about hydrogen is that it's this energy carrier that can store energy over long periods of time and then transport that energy over large distances. And so that lends itself very well to large scale energy storage applications, for example, which is going to be essential when we think about the integration of more and more renewables. You know, re renewable energy from wind and solar, it's, it's not always available at the time um, for peak demand for electricity. So this creates a need for large scale energy storage that can't be completely met by batteries or by other conventional methods like pumped hydro. So to foster that continued growth of renewable power generation, we need to have this large scale energy storage and, and hydrogen can be added to that mix um, to really help uh, provide another solution. So hydrogen, it's a carbon-free molecule, right? It, it can be made using 
renewable feedstocks or with low carbon intensity. Um, so it really has the potential to reduce emissions economy wide. Uh, this chart here is from Goldman Sachs carbonomics report, um, which estimates that clean hydrogen really has the potential to decarbonize about 45% of our greenhouse gas emissions globally. And that includes those hard to abate sectors that I mentioned earlier. So long haul transportation, um, industrial processes, heating, and, and even long-term power storage. Um, and so, you know, that's why there is a lot of interest around, you know, how do we use hydrogen optimally in which sectors and markets do we see it evolving and growing as, as we look towards that 2050 timeframe. So the, the versatility of hydrogen, you know, it, it creates this really great opportunity for it to become a bigger part of our energy system, as well as, um, you know, different parts of our economy. So we know we're going to need an array of solutions and pathways to be able to decarbonize. And that really means, you know, exploring um, you know, different designs to our energy system. So hydrogen, it, it's not going to be a replacement for all of our existing sources of energy, but, you know, we think with innovation and a really thoughtful approach, it can be used in an optimal manner, um, you know, to be able to decarbonize those hard to abate sectors, those that are energy intensive or require uh, high heat applications like heavy industry. Um, a lot of the same applications that utilize natural gas right now. So, you know, hydrogen, it can be produced from a variety of resources and feedstocks through numerous conversion pathways. You know, wind and solar can be used with electrolysis to produce hydrogen. You can use biomass feedstocks through gasification, and you can also utilize fossil fuels. Um, and then very similar to natural gas, it can serve, you know, many sectors of the economy um, in a number of applications, whether it's to provide heat, fuel, or, or transportation, or even for, for power generation. Um, so it really has great diversity, but I think what we want to drive home here is that we want to be able to use it um, in, in a really optimal manner. So a lot of times when we talk about hydrogen or when, when hydrogen is, is discussed, you know, it's really focused around a couple of key pathways um, to be able to produce hydrogen. So that's typically around um, steam methane reforming um, or electrolysis, but there are a number of other routes um, that can be utilized to produce hydrogen. And I I think, um, sorry, I'm having some technical issues here. Can you guys still see the slides? Yes, Christine, they're still up. We're on the hydrogen production pathways slide. Okay, I seem to have lost the window for Zoom, so I can't actually see you guys or the um, chat. Let me try. Okay. Okay. Um, Are you back? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and so here's a, a chart that really displays the various uh, hydrogen production pathways. You know, either you're starting with fossil fuel sources um, like natural gas or even coal, or you're using uh, renewable sources. Um, and then, you know, you have a number of either biological or therm thermochemical type of pathways um, to be able to then convert uh, those feedstocks into hydrogen. Uh, right now, globally, there's about 70 million metric tons of hydrogen that is used, and about 95% of that is coming from fossil fuels. So it's actually a carbon intensive process, um, and it's mainly utilizing uh, steam methane reforming in terms of the conversion technology. So even when we think about, you know, the the current market for hydrogen, there's great opportunity to be able to decarbonize that. So in terms of the current hydrogen market, right now, most of, and this is focused primarily on the US, most of the hydrogen is used uh, primarily in refineries, um, in ammonia production, and then also in methanol uh, production or other synthetic fuels. 
Um, and a lot of the hydrogen then is actually supplied by you know, the traditional industrial gas companies. So you're probably very familiar with the air products and, and Lindian and Air Liquide. So that's really where most of the hydrogen um, is being produced um, and how it's being used. But obviously we're very interested in hydrogen because of the other applications and the other markets that you know, potentially it can help decarbonize. So in terms of the overall you know, potential, there's a lot of studies that have been done to really look at what the economic and technical potential of hydrogen is. Um, I've only thrown up a couple of charts here. Uh, the one on the right is actually um, from a study that was conducted uh, probably about a year ago, but it's the, the roadmap to um, the US hydrogen economy. Um, and this was really a collaborative effort among many stakeholders um, from technical organizations to industry. Um, and what they were estimating was there's a, probably about 17 million metric tons of hydrogen that could be utilized by 2030. A lot of it is focused around the, the transportation sector, um, but it also models that hydrogen could potentially meet up to 14% of US energy demand by 2050. Um, one of the more recent studies was conducted by uh, NREL, so DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab. So the chart on the left is from a techno-economic assessment that they did on their H2 at scale program. And that estimates that the economic uh, potential for hydrogen is about 40 million metric tons um, by 2050. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth noting and diving into a little bit more detail here with rel relative to this chart, but so NREL modeled um, different scenarios to be able to determine the demand and the supply. Um, so you can see here they have a reference or a base case, and then if you look down the rows, you know, you see um, different scenarios with uh, increasingly aggressive um, progress being made in R&D and different technologies such as electrolyzers. And that's primarily around being able to drive down the cost with the production of green hydrogen. Um, and so you, if, if you look at uh, the chart, you can see, and, and then also look at the demand is on the left and then the supply is on the right. Um, it, it's worth noting that you, you, um, as you go down the rows and you look at like the lowest cost electrolysis scenario um, where you're having like very uh, cost competitive green hydrogen production costs, um, you do see larger, a larger market associated um, with different sectors, um, especially when you look at kind of that light duty fuel cell um, vehicle sector, whereas in in other um, scenarios, especially in the reference case where you're not seeing kind of that advancement in technology or R&D, you know, you don't see that uh, market captured on the transportation space. And then same goes on the supply side, right? So if you're not seeing that advancement in technology, you're still going to continue to use C-methane reforming as your primary pathway to be able to produce hydrogen. Um, but then, you know, as you see the, the technology advancing, cost coming down, you're going to see a larger portion being provided by uh, electrolytic based type of processes to produce hydrogen. Great, Christine, let me just uh, interrupt for just a moment and remind our <coughs> viewers that to use the chat function if you have questions for Christine. This is terrific. Thank you. Great. So we'll talk a little bit about the supply chain for hydrogen. So it's pretty complex. Um, you know, as I, I talked about earlier, you need to be able to generate hydrogen. So the production pathways are really going to vary. Um, and so unlike natural gas, you know, there's multiple ways to be able to produce um, hydrogen. There's also a variety of ways to be able to transport and store hydrogen. So, you know, right now it's pretty common to be able to use tube trailers and in terms of being able to transport, especially if you're going shorter um, distances, but there's also the opportunity to use pipelines. So, you know, today there's probably about 1600 miles of dedicated, you know, hydrogen pipelines. Um, those are mostly along the Gulf Coast. So really in Texas and the Louisiana area. Um, but, you know, there's also some, for example, in, in Indiana, um, but obviously not as extensive as the natural gas uh, pipeline network. 
Um, there's also a, a lot of interest around transporting hydrogen in the form of ammonia. Um, you know, I think that's primarily around ports. So you see more and more um, investigation and exploration um, where you look towards the future of maybe being able to export hydrogen in the form of ammonia. So very similar opportunities to what we see uh, currently with LNG. I think in terms of you know, opportunities specifically for utilities and pipeline operators, there's obviously um, you know, the opportunity around being able to leverage your existing infrastructure, you know, your pipeline assets. You know, the hydrogen has to be able to get from the supply to the demand center and building out new infrastructure is going to be expensive. So, you know, what can we do to explore how to retrofit or modify our infrastructure to be able to deliver that hydrogen? So I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in that space, but that's definitely an area of interest. And, and even in the conversations that we're having with different pipeline operators and gas utilities who are thinking about what their business is going to look like, how it's going to evolve in that post-2030 timeframe. You know, as we strive towards a net zero um, society in 2050, you know, they're thinking about the types of molecules that they're going to move. Maybe it is not just methane, right? Maybe we're talking about hydrogen. Maybe we're talking about um, ammonia. Maybe we're looking at, you know, synthetic uh, methane or, or other low carbon resources. Um, but, you know, really trying to figure out how to best leverage those infrastructure assets as, as we move towards a more low carbon energy future. So, you know, all of this really has culminated into GTI creating this hydrogen technology center. Um, you know, we just launched that um, at the uh, last year. Um, so we're very excited to really bring together um, and coordinate all of our hydrogen expertise and capabilities and, and lab facilities um, and, and really coordinate on how we advance hydrogen as a part of our energy system. So, you know, we're in this energy transition. We're trying to shift from carbon intensive sources of energy to low carbon solutions. And this, this pathway to decarbonization is going to be complex, um, but I think that you know, many of us are really aligning around this shared vision where we are driving towards this low carbon future. And one that actually is going to encompass multiple forms of energy, whether we're talking about moving electrons or moving molecules. Um, so within our uh, center, we're really focused on developing technology solutions for the, all parts of that value chain, right? So the make, move, store, and use. And we're doing this through collaboration because we recognize to advance these technologies, you know, that requires scale and it requires diverse partners. And we, we need to innovate in how we produce and deliver and use energy because we know that, you know, what we did in the past isn't going to work for a low carbon future. And that means we need to explore different designs to our energy system, right? So we're not, we're, we're not saying hydrogen is the solution to everything, um, but it will be one of the solutions that we need to be able to deploy to reach these very aggressive um, climate goals. So we do have at GTI very rich history in hydrogen research, you know, from our testing and demonstration facilities across that full value chain. Um, you know, whether we're talking about focusing on transportation um, or even looking at potentially blending hydrogen for use in buildings, right? What, how, how can we do that? What would be the effects on existing residential appliances? So we have ongoing research looking at that. Um, and then we have a, a, a broad array of technologies, even on the production uh, side. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but we do have technologies that are able to produce um, low carbon hydrogen through a couple key conversion pathways. Um, so I'll touch on kind of this blue hydrogen pathway. I think ultimately we don't necessarily want to focus on all of the colors of hydrogen, whether that's gray, blue, green, turquoise. Um, I think what, wanna, want, what we do want to focus on is the fact that we want the process to be low carbon, right? We want to be able to either use renewable feedstocks or to be able to capture that carbon, have that post carbon capture. And so moving um, forward towards that view of, of 2050 and, and kind of that net zero vision, we 
are very aligned with some of the other projections and studies that have been put out there where we will see a mix of both blue and green hydrogen um, that's being supplied and utilized. Um, you know, this chart up here is actually from BP's um, energy outlook where, you know, even as they look towards 2050 in their net zero um, use case, you do see a mix of blue and green. I think in the short and the, the near term, blue hydrogen really offers great opportunity to help advance um, the supply of hydrogen, but just also the, the utilization in, in various applications. Um, and so we're very aligned around that and, and we have our own technology um, to help provide that type of low carbon hydrogen. So, you know, I think one of the very important pathways to be able to decarbonize our economy um, is through clean electricity generation. So we recognize, you know, we're gonna have integration of renewables like wind and solar, and we're gonna continue to have conversion of, you know, coal to gas for power generation. Um, but all of that isn't going to be enough. And that's why even, you know, our work with utilities, they're very interested in how they can utilize low carbon fuels um, to deliver cleaner energy to their customers. So, you know, we think that this technology is, is really going to help enable that. Um, I talked a little bit about earlier how most of the hydrogen today is produced from fossil fuels like natural gas. But if you can couple that with carbon capture, that creates a, a low carbon path. So we have a technology, um, we think it's disruptive, it's able to produce low cost clean hydrogen from natural gas. Um, and the unique feature about it is that it has inherent carbon capture versus post carbon capture, which is what is traditionally used. So traditionally you have to have, you know, some add on amine system, um, which is very costly. So the fact that we have this inherent carbon capture in our process dramatically reduces the, the capital expenditures as well as the overall, overall levelized cost of hydrogen. So it's a sorbent enhanced reforming process. It captures the CO2 in a solid sorbent particulate. Um, and then the process really enables them that absorb CO2 to be delivered as a, a nearly pure CO2 stream that can um, be either compressed and then stored for sequestration or potentially um, for other uses where now you could potentially convert that CO2 um, into synthetic fuels, for example, create some other value add products. So it is very cost competitive when you compare it to the traditional steam methane reforming um, technologies. You can see that um, in the chart up here. Um, but what it does is because you're able to produce a higher quality hydrogen stream, you eliminate that need for that costly um, system to separate out that CO2. So this results in a process um, with 30% fewer costs and an actually higher efficiency than your traditional steam methane um, reforming technologies. Also, when you compare it to uh, a combined cycle, a natural gas combined cycle plant with carbon capture at the end, um, you know, it's also very competitive. So the charts that I have up here are some of the preliminary techno-econ assessments that we've done for the technology. Um, and, and we've gotten a number of um, awards from DOE to advance this technology. Um, we're building a pilot facility here um, at GTI in our Illinois facilities. And then we're also building a pilot facility in the UK. So that's pretty exciting. Um, it's called the Hyper Project, but we're partnered with Cranfield University as well as Doosan, where we're building um, the equivalent of a 1.5 megawatt pilot facility for this uh, specific technology to be able to, to produce clean hydrogen. So here, Christine, in this chart, you're, I'm, I'm trying to, you explained it very well. I just want to make it sort of relate to me here. So what I'm seeing on the left-hand side is the cost of generating electricity using uh, just regular gas, right? What's HHV? I guess that's what I'm confused about. Yeah, so on the left side, um, it is the cost of being able to um, produce electricity. Um, you ha We have a couple... Um, scenarios. So you have a natural gas combined cycle plant with carbon capture. Um, you also have a natural gas combined uh, cycle plant um, using a hydrogen blend via uh, steam methane reforming. Um, 
And then you also have the two scenarios, which include uh, GTI's technology. So you couple your NGCC with um, the compact hydrogen generator, um, you kind of using existing uh, existing equipment and then in the future kind of the advanced hydrogen turbines so we're working with some of the OEMs um, who are looking at you know initially blending but then also potentially a hundred percent scenario where the hydrogen is coming from our compact hydrogen generator technology. So the assumption here is three dollars a million uh, an MMBTU for for natural gas is that correct? Correct yeah in our, oh, in our okay. assumptions. Yes. And what's the six dollar and thirteen cent assumption? Um, that is per million BTU. Yes. Oh, so we so we were we're, we're comparing two different cases. Okay. So, and then and then just one last question on this point: uh, Is the fifty dollars per metric ton CO two credit is that a today's market for clean food quality CO two? Uh, yeah, so I mean that's kind of that's an estimate, right? Because you see you see some um, studies that are using fifty dollars, you see some studies using a hundred. You know, here I guess we're being a little bit conservative um, and using the fifty dollars, but you know that's currently there's no price <laughs> right now. Right. Well, I mean there is there is a price for CO two being traded in the food markets, right? For beverages and yeah. Like, I'm just curious how this relates to that that market? Have you guys looked at that at all? I, yeah, I haven't looked at that market specifically. I think, you know, this is based on, you know, some of the other existing studies around, you know, what would be the cost of carbon in terms of, you know, penalty and, and releasing CO2 emissions. Okay. Uh, then the last question is, uh, have you thought about using, for instance, a social cost of carbon uh, instead of this $50 uh, megaton, which actually pushes it pushes the number up? Uh, I get, but you know, depending on which discount rate you use, but yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So we haven't done it in our own analysis. This was done specifically for Department of Energy for one of our projects. Um, but I, I, I have seen other studies that have utilized kind of that social cost of carbon. Um, one of the more recent ones has been through um, resources for the future. So they actually did a study looking at kind of policies and incentives to spur um, the adoption of hydrogen, but they were focused primarily around the power generation and industrial sector. And then I do have one question from the audience uh, for the chart on the side, the levelized cost of hydrogen. Uh, or it, the, in, which includes total installed cost. What the installed cost is for a project of roughly what size? So what, yeah. what size project are you installing? Yeah, yeah. So I don't have those numbers up here, but this would be like a large commercial scale, um, like you know, large megawatt scales. Thank you. So we also want to be able to produce hydrogen in, in other pathways. So, you know, really looking at other feedstocks. Um, one of them is to be able to leverage biomass, for example. So GTI actually has a very long history in gasification technologies. Um, and recently we actually spun off a company called Sun Gas Renewables. Um, and so we're taking advantage of our UGAS technology, um, which is able to convert biomass, such as woody biomass, um, into other types of renewable fuels. And so you can see on the chart here, you know, we're, we're able to produce RNG, we could take it to hydrogen, you, we could produce drop-in liquid fuels, um, but we really see this, you know, great market opportunity to produce to be able to provide a commercial solution um, for renewable fuels. Um, so this is just another technology that, you know, we're very excited to be able to get into the marketplace. Um, and then, you know, it offers a variety of pathways um, for the production of different types of renewable fuels. So I think now I'm gonna transition to focus um, the discussion around infrastructure. Um, so, you know, as we transition to these low carbon energy sources, we want to be able to make sure that we're able to get that energy to where we need it and when we need it. 
and you know very in line with you know the current um, you know natural gas um, delivery. We want to be able to do that in an affordable and reliable and resilient manner. Um, and so that's why we're very interested in how we can utilize our existing infrastructure. Um, so how do we use, utilize our existing pipelines? You know, we have vast amounts of storage capacity as well that provides really unparalleled and, and, and also very important to note, you know, proven deliverability of these fuels so that you can have that energy where you need it, when you need it. Um, and then that I think can really support, um, you know, broader scale deployment of hydrogen. So we want to be thinking about how can we leverage these assets, right? We have over 2 million miles of gas pipelines here in the U.S. Um, that, you know, offers really reliable long distance energy transport um, and, you know, vast storage capacity, which is really key in helping to address seasonal um, demand variation. So, you know, if we take just a closer look, um, you know, primarily around our natural gas storage, right? This is a really phenomenal resource. Um, it provides significantly more storage capacity than pumped hydro or batteries. Um, and so this is really important when we're considering, you know, different geographic energy needs. Um, you know, the natural gas underground storage capacity that, that um, comprises greater than 95% of utility energy storage capacity. Um, during peak cold spells, right, this, this gas storage can flex, I think, up to 600 gigawatts of sustained energy delivery capacity. So this is a resource that we want to be able to leverage as we, as we explore, you know, low carbon gases such as hydrogen. So back in 2013, um, we actually did an initial assessment of hydrogen blending. Um, so this was done for DOE's uh, National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, but we looked at a couple of key issues related to hydrogen blending in pipelines. You know, we reviewed what was um, what had been currently done in terms of research um, and R and D in that space. Um, you know, looking at the existing natural gas pipeline network you know, a cursory look at what would be the impacts on end use systems, especially around combustion of hydrogen, you know, safety considerations, um, you know, leakage, for example. And so this report, it is publicly available, but what it did was, you know, it set the stage for um, all of the work that we have going on right now around hydrogen blending. So, you know, it led to some of our current studies where we're actually doing some um, physical testing on the impacts of hydrogen on different pipeline materials and just other operational issues as it relates to pipeline operators and utilities. Um, so this chart here, I know it's a mess, it's very difficult to read. I'm happy to, to provide you the, the report, the actual report that was produced. Um, but I, I throw this up here to really show that there's still a lot of technical gaps and research that needs to be conducted um, when we look at the impacts of hydrogen and varying blends of hydrogen on natural gas systems. So this, this report is, or this uh, graphic is from a report that was put together by the European um, Transmission System Operators Group. Um, the gas infrastructure uh, Europe group and then hydrogen in Europe. Um, so what they did was they released this, this paper um, that really looked at a number of fundamental questions around hydrogen um, transport and storage. Um, and it, it really looks at some key um, objectives around, um, you know, what's been currently done in terms of the R&D, you know, publicly available information and then the gaps that exist. So the assessment, it was based on some of the R&D projects that are being done in Europe, existing codes and standards, working with manufacturers and just, you know, company expertise. What I want to highlight here, because it is difficult to see, but, you know, they bucketed it into um, different categories based on kind of that value chain. So you have transmission, you have guest storage, um, you know, on the distribution side, for example, they looked at impacts on, you know, um, plastic pipe, on steel, on cast iron, on the end use side, you have residential appliances, you have mobility. Um, and then they categorized it, you know, the impacts, kind of an initial screening, like in the green, there's not going to be any significant issues. Um, you know, the red is not technically feasible, but what I want, and then, you know, you see on the column on the left um, is actually the blend of hydrogen. And so what I want to highlight is, 
The gray is actually areas where we need more R&D and more testing. And so you see a lot of gray on the chart. Um, and so if we do wanna be able to leverage our existing infrastructure, we also wanna make sure that we're doing it in a very safe and responsible manner. And we, we know that you know, there's a lot of variation just when we think about the characterization of our pipeline system, you know, the different materials, the different vintages, and all of that is going to impact, you know, how hydrogen is going to react with that system. So we want to make sure that we're able to do the proper testing and validation um, to know that, you know, as we integrate hydrogen, we're doing it in a safe um, manner. So, you know, uh, at GTI, we do have a number of efforts where we're looking at this. Right. We know that as we integrate hydrogen, there's going to be challenges, but that's why we need to do these additional studies and and testing to really determine, you know, what modifications are needed to repurpose our gas infrastructure to transport that hydrogen. How do we adapt existing pipeline monitoring and maintenance practices, for example, to do this? Um, and then also look at being able to establish safety factors for hydrogen gas systems. You know, um, you know, we need to do this uh, based on material tests performed under, you know, very specific, site-specific, um, you know, and, and relevant environmental and, and material conditions. Um, and I'm so sorry, there's a, there, I think they're doing lawn work out there at the office. Okay, I, I thought that might be your own audio or video, but yeah, it's okay. We've got, now at least we've explained the hum. Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> That's fine. You're, you're doing fine. Just gets a little fuzzy on occasion, but we can hear you just fine. Okay. So, um, so at GTI, we're assessing the effects of hydrogen blending on different pipeline materials. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, things like operational safety, addressing integrity and, and operational compatibility. So some of our initial research focused on testing non-metallic pipelines. Um, so really focus on plastic on a 5% blend of hydrogen with natural gas. So we did focus primarily on vintage materials such as LDLA as well as some elastomers. And what we saw from our testing was overall at the 5% hydrogen blend, um, it didn't appear to have any significant impacts on the integrity of these materials. However, it, as we know, it can have an impact on pipeline steels and welds you know, it can reduce the fracture toughness, you have the resistance to crack propagation and ductility and increases in, in fatigue crack growth rates. So we want to be able to do some future testing on um, material specific, uh, specific materials and, and then use case specific testing. So through this work, ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to adapt existing engineering tools that you already utilize as a part of your pipeline integrity assessments, right? Mm -hmm. So adapting failure assessment diagrams, for example, um, critical flaw curves and, and crack growth rate plots to really assess, you know, what hydrogen blending impacts are on existing pipelines. Um, this slide up here kind of summarizes some of the high points associated with our previous testing. So the previous research, as I mentioned, focused um, on assessing the material integrity and some of the operational compatibility of really a bounded natural gas pipeline system and its components. So it was bounded at a 5% hydrogen blend and you know we're trying to determine if there were any system upgrades that might be necessary to reduce the risk and, and, and support the interchangeability of a 5% hydrogen blend. Um, and so, you know, the, the project focused um, on two non-metallic pipeline component materials for testing the LDLA, um, and then we also um, picked a representative um, elastomer, so we chose SBR. So again, overall, didn't have any significant impacts on the integrity of the non-metallic uh, materials, but that was at a low blend. Obviously, more research needs to be done at higher blends. Um, and then also more um, looking at uh, steel material specifically. So we've continued on that work. We have a project now focused on assessing impacts of hydrogen blends on steel. One of the early steps in the project was to establish what the use cases under consideration for hydrogen blending would be. So we, we surveyed our utility sponsors. Um, so there, some of the results of the survey are shown on this slide, but as you can see, there is quite a bit of variation when it comes to the pipeline systems and the characteristics 
which really demonstrates why you know we need to have you know use case specific and and characterization and assessment of, of these systems um, is going to vary, right? So the next step for us is to be able to select and obtain some of these vintage materials and then conduct the physical testing. And so we've already identified an early set of proposed tests that are presented here um, that would be needed to calculate various parameters um, to make these engineering decision, decisions and, and to create these engineering tools, as I highlighted earlier, um, you know, to, in order to really characterize the effect of hydrogen blending on a specific system. So there's other work that's going on um, in the hydrogen blending space. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So collaboration is going to be key. So we do have collaboration with the broader R&D uh, community. Um, and so we are participating in research that's being conducted by uh, the, the US national labs on hydrogen blending. So the high blend project, which uh, some of you may be familiar with is being led by NREL, um, but it's a, a consortium of national labs conducting research around hydrogen blending um, on specific pipeline materials and components. I would say um, it's more uh, fundamental in terms of the type of research and testing that they're doing really at the lab scale, um, but GTI is the industry lead. Um, so we are going to be uh, working with um, the national labs, providing some you know, technical advisory roles as well as some cost share to help advance um, you know, the, the development of this project. And so with regards to the hydrogen compatibility of, of piping and, and pipelines, um, the project will conduct some specific material testing at the lab inch scale, ultimately to help develop lifetime prediction models for hydrogen blends. Um, Argon is going to be conducting a life cycle analysis. So they'll analyze life cycle emissions of technologies using hydrogen and natural gas blends. Um, and maybe even look at some alternative pathways such as synthetic um, methane. And then NREL will also be doing a techno-econ analysis, you know, trying to quantify the costs and opportunities for hydrogen production and blending in the natural gas network, as well as, you know, different pathways um, and to produce it. So, you know, the, the charts that I have up here show some of the estimates that have been put together um, associated with economics around hydrogen delivery and storage as we're leveraging natural gas infrastructure. What I do want to note is that most of these estimates are based on European studies. Um, so we definitely need to do more studies here in the US um, so that we have better information, better cost estimates around this. Um, what you can see is that retrofitting is much more cost effective um, than building out new infrastructure. What we've seen from some of the studies in Europe and, and primarily um, the European hydrogen backbone study is that compression is actually a, a big driving cost um, associated uh, with the cost of, um, of retrofitting uh, existing natural gas uh, systems. Um, and so I won't dive into specific detail uh, here because I do have a number of other slides that I want to cover, but I would encourage everyone to read that European Hydrogen Backbone Study it does a good job of kind of laying out how they're looking at identifying specific parts of their transmission network um, to, to retrofit and convert over to delivering hydrogen to large demand centers that they see developing in different places in Europe. Christine, I just want to do a quick time check. We're about 10 minutes out. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm uh, a couple other uh, areas that we're doing research is also on end use. So we know that when we think about uh, using hydrogen for combustion, especially around residential um, applications, that there's going to be some challenges. Um, I think the general consensus is that at low blends, five to 15% are, are probably suitable. But again, similar to the, the last um, chart that I showed, a lot of this is from European studies. Um, you know, so we do need to, to conduct our own studies here in the US, but you know, just to highlight some of the things that you know, we, we should um, be concerned about, you know, while you know, hydrogen is carbon free, there's no CO2 emissions, there is 
the potential that you know NOx emissions could form. Um, the flame, hydrogen flame, is, is hotter and faster, which could potentially lead to some flame stability issues. Um, and then, you know, also uh, you want to make sure that, you know, we have the right monitoring and, and leak detection equipment because hydrogen um, flames are invisible. And so we'll, we'll need the proper uh, tools to be able to monitor and detect. And so GTI, along with a number of other organizations like UC Irvine um, and other utilities have conducted some testing on various hydrogen blends on residential appliances. Um, there are some limited data sets, but there's, there's some mixed conclusions, um, which suggests that we, we might need some additional testing. Um, but preliminary testing in our own lab suggests that at the medium to low blend percentages, so up to 30%, there is minimal impact. So we didn't see any noticeable changes in ignition or stability, no flashback issues. Um, and so that's all very promising, but obviously we had a limited data set. So we wanna be able to expand that testing to a larger set of appliances and then possibly um, look at commercial or industrial equipment as well. Um, we're also doing a lot in the transportation space. So I might just highlight one um, projects that we were recently awarded uh, through the California Energy Commission, and that's actually around utilizing hydrogen um, for locomotives. So we're, we're working directly with Shell as well as Sierra Northern Railway um, to develop a hydrogen locomotive prototype um, that would be used at the Port of Sacramento. So we're pretty excited. We think there's great opportunity, especially in the rail and marine space for the utilization of hydrogen. So, you know, how, how does all of these different pieces of hydrogen come together? How can it be enabled? Um, you know, one of the things that we are focused on is the creation or the potential around creating hydrogen hubs. So that's really um, going to be critical to advancing hydrogen. Um, and, and it's really where you're able to create networks where supply and demand are matched regionally or locally. Um, while being able to use existing infrastructure assets to help foster that hydrogen market and, and, um, and growth. So the scenarios and the use cases may differ depending on, you know, energy needs. Um, but we think that, you know, this is a way to really help spur the creation of a hydrogen market. And we have a great opportunity through one of our projects through DOE um, to help shape what that's going to look like. So we are very excited to be a part of what is going to be the first large scale demonstration of a hydrogen network in the US. So we have funding from DOE. Um, we have a number of industry partners and together with Frontier University and uh, Frontier Energy and the University of Texas at Austin, we're going to build and operate a hydrogen infrastructure network. So we will have on-site renewable hydrogen production through two conversion pathways, one via electrolysis, um, and then another one through a small scale steam methane reformer where we're going to use renewable natural gases, the feedstock. Um, we'll, we're looking to produce about 95 kilograms a day of hydrogen. Um, we'll store that hydrogen on site, and then we'll also demonstrate the use of that hydrogen in various end-use applications. Um, one for on-site fueling, um, it's going to fuel several Toyota Mirais, as well as powering a um, 100 kilowatt fuel cell to provide backup power for a data center on campus. Another key um, portion of that project is actually conducting a feasibility study that's focused around the Port of Houston. So really looking at how can we scale up hydrogen production and use um, and, and leverage existing assets and, and resources. So the study is going to model the growth of a hydrogen economy, specifically in Texas, assuming different technology options, policy options, and, and economic options. And that Gulf Coast area, um, is, it's already a base right, for hydrogen in the US. Um, there is a number of hydrogen production plants. There's over 900 miles of hydrogen, dedicated hydrogen pipelines, as well as subsurface storage of hydrogen in salt caverns. So it makes for an ideal location for um, a hydrogen hub. Um, and so we hope that the framework that we're developing can then be replicated and implemented in, in other parts of the US to help create more hydrogen networks. And then we also have another project that's um, focused in Illinois, 
um, looking at coupling hydrogen, on-site hydrogen generation using our technology with um, larger scale power generation. So some of our partners include Mitsubishi Heavy Industry and, and Ameren, um, but the other key pieces associated with this are then taking that CO2 um, and sequestering it in the geologic formations um, in that region, as well as demonstrating subsurface storage of hydrogen. So really comprehensive in, in terms of a hydro integrated hydrogen demonstration project. Um, and then I'll, I'll just uh, maybe mention the, the last uh, initiative here, which is our low carbon resources initiative. You may have seen um, some, uh, some uh, press around it, but it's really a partnership that we established with Electric Power Research Institute um, that's focused on uh, advancing low carbon technologies in the post 2030 timeframe. Um, so we're very focused around hydrogen, ammonia, biofuels, and synthetic fuels. And so we developed this R&D collaborative. We have 46 members. Most of them are electric and gas utilities, some OEMs like Mitsubishi and GE. But to date, we have 100 and I think $24 million in R&D funding to help advance these low carbon technologies so that we can get to net zero by 2050. So very excited to have launched that program. Um, and so I, I might just wrap it up here. I know we're running out of time, but you know, we're very excited to help you know, shape what this clean energy transition is going to look like. We think hydrogen is going to be a, a critical element um, and we're looking forward to collaborating um, and working on innovative solutions and, and really supporting disruptive solutions at scale. So um, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to future discussions uh, with you all. Christine, I do have one question from the audience here. Do we know when this will be up and running? I think this is referring probably to uh, both the low carbon initiative as well as the, I think particularly the hydrogen hub projects. Sure, yeah. So the H2 at scale project that we have in Texas has already been funded, it's initiated, but I would say the actual demonstration piece probably won't be till later this year when um, the different pieces have been constructed and built. Um, the Low Carbon Resources Initiative we launched last year, but we're actively looking for um, new members and, and growing that membership base. So if you're interested, I would say, please feel free to reach out to me um, and happy to engage with you all on that. How do we get one of those uh, H2 at scale projects up here in the Northwest? You come, actually, there is an RFI from DOE that's out right now where they're looking for a uh, project concept. So if you're interested, GTI is going to put in a response. We'd love to partner with you all. Great. Okay. Uh, well, with that, Christine, we're going to, we're running right up against our one o'clock deadline. So we're going to say thank you very much. And that was a terrific presentation. Folks, we hope you'll uh, join us 